Hello, and thank you for joining us for our 2022 Thomas A. Edison Regional Science and Inventors Fairs Award Ceremonies. We want to thank you for your patience this year as we return to a virtual fair format. We realize it's not the ideal way to conduct an authentic, in-person science and inventors fairs, but we want to personally thank all the teachers, parents, judges, community members, and students for their dedication and support of our fair program. This year, nearly 400 projects and students participated in our virtual science and inventors fairs. While we normally see over 700 students and projects enter our fairs, we long for an in-person event and we hope to return to that event next year. We also want to let you know that if you receive a special award, chances are we will be following up with you via email to collect some additional information so that those awards can be presented to you. Also, all students receiving awards, we want to let you know those awards will be delivered to your school so that you and your school can celebrate in your success. Hello and welcome to our 2022 Thomas Alva Edison Kiwanis Regional Science and Engineering Fair Awards Ceremony. I'm Lee Hughes, Director of the Regional Science Fair and along with Dr. Gary Nelson, Co-Chair of our Thomas A. Edison Regional Science and Inventors Fairs Steering Committee. We are so happy that you joined us for this year's awards program. Since 1958, the Thomas A. Edison Regional Science and Inventors Fair program has been rich in history and full of promise for the future. Our regional program includes Regional Science Fair, the Regional Inventors Fair, which is now known as the Florida Gulf Coast Invention Convention, and our Suncoast Credit Union Elementary Science Expo. These three fairs represent the largest pre-collegiate STEM program in Southwest Florida. Our program over the last few years has also included summer camps for students, ranging in grades from elementary to middle school. These camps include the Whitaker Center for STEM Education at Florida Gulf Coast University Summer Research Opportunity and STEM Buccaneers Camp at Florida Southwestern State College. Our program also includes the Edison Fairs Art Contest, which Vanessa Kinley, grade 11 student at Benita Springs High School, won for the third consecutive year. Thank you, Vanessa, for your artistic contribution to our fair program. We also relish in taking students to State Science Fair, where students represent our regional fair as State Science Fair finalists, and we look forward to taking our team to Lakeland, Lakeland Florida this March. Over the years, we've also had students represented in the Broadcom Masters competition, which is the premier STEM event for middle school students. Stay tuned for more information about this program later this evening. And we have a rich tradition of taking students to the International Science Fair. And we're elated to let you know that six projects from our senior division will be moving on to this year's Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair in Atlanta, Georgia in May. And of course, we'd like to give special thanks to our 2022 Regional Science Fair sponsors, including Kiwanis of Fort Myers, Charlotte County Public Schools, Lee County Public Schools, Florida Gulf Coast University, Florida Southwestern State College, our many, many community sponsors, and Sony Electronics for sponsoring this evening's grand awards and prizes. This year, Sony donated over $14,000 in prizes and awards and has been a 25-year sponsor of this event. Thank you, Sony, for your contribution and your support over the years. And as always, you can follow us and share in your STEM success with our social media accounts. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Edison Fairs. And as always, we encourage you to use the hashtag Edison Fairs in your social media posts. And now we'd like to announce our 2022 special award recipients. This year's AIM Engineering and Surveying $50 cash awards are presented to, in the junior division, Mason Huffman, Sephora Esperance, and Miles Hammond. And from the senior division, Jax Mendelson and Caroline Guerra. 
Congratulations to these students, and thank you, AIM Engineering and Surveying. The American Association of University Women, Woman and STEM Award, a certificate, $500, and luncheon invitation is presented to Senior Division, Kendall Williams. Congratulations, Kendall, and thank you, AAUW. The American Association of University Women First Timer Award, a certificate, $100, and luncheon invitation is presented to, in the Senior Division, Ava Broadhead, Estero High School. Congratulations, Ava, and thank you, AAUW. The American Meteorological Society Certificate Award presented to, in the Junior Division, Mark Chung, and from the Senior Division, Lauren Friedman and Eric Courtney. Congratulations to these students and thank you AMS. This year's American Psychological Association Achievement in Psychological Science certificate presented to, from the Junior Division, Margaret Swift and Imoni Ahmad. Congratulations to these students and thank you to the American Psychological Association. The ASM Materials Education Foundation certificate presented to the following projects. In the Senior Division, Jacob Silver and Caroline Guerra. Congratulations to these two students and thank you ASM Materials Education Foundation. And now, let's spotlight some of our Edison Fairs finalists. Hello, my name is Sarah Engel and my project is a Salty Slick. My project is a continuation of my last year's project. Last year, I tested which sorbent would work better in an oil spill. This year, I thought I would expand on this by testing if the best sorbent from last year, 403, would be affected by the salinity of water in an oil recovery. I hypothesized that better salinities would boost the effectiveness of a sorbent and oil absorption. I hypothesized this due to the intensified water cycle and global warming causing decreased salinity in polar regions and increased salinity in equatorial regions. As salinity increases, so does density. Density affects how oil will float on water. The greater the density, the oil will float better. The lower the density, the oil will sink. This makes it for a harder cleanup. I tested multiple types of salinities. They were 8.2 parts per thousand, 18.2 parts per thousand, 36.6 parts per thousand, 42 parts per thousand, 50.1 parts per thousand, and 70 parts per thousand. I choose these salinities because they were close to the salinities of estuaries in the ocean. My control was zero parts per thousand. The control in each solution was tested using 25 milliliters of oil and 10 grams of 403 in a boom and observed for five minutes. The boom was removed and weighed, and the remaining oil water was weighed and measured. The tests were repeated five times for the control in each solution. In conclusion, my hypothesis was correct because higher salinities absorb more oil than lower salinities. To elaborate on this project, I could test if other sorbents would be affected by the salinity, or I could change the temperature to see if it would have an effect on the sorbents. Thank you for your time, judges. The Association of Women Geoscientists, a certificate is presented to the following projects. In the Junior Division, Kaylee Montgomery, and Senior Division, Jessica Marchese. Congratulations and thank you, AWG. Earlier, I mentioned the Broadcom Masters Program, the premier STEM event for middle school students. This year's 2022 Broadcom Masters nominees are presented to the following projects who will receive a packet and nomination for this year's Broadcom Masters program. Congratulations to the following students. Zaid Al-Salman, Natalia Bendek, Leah Chung, Mark Chung, Gabriel Cintron, Adam Kornak, Kaylee Della Luna, Caleb Donnelly, Thomas Eichen, Sarah Engel, Curacula Soraya Fernando, Isabel Giddens, Nisanir Gunner, Miles Hammond, Caroline Hathaway, Mason Huffman, Celia Abanez Garnier, Caden Kellum, 
Swearin Korzak, Emma Kramer, Olivia Lee, Tanish Madhar, Abian Malik, Sophia Mayas, Shuniska Meta, Jackson Moaning, Ivan Peeve, Leah Scotty, Margaret Swift, and Levi Townsend. Congratulations to all of these middle school students for earning nominations for this year's Broadcom Masters. We encourage you to apply and participate in this program. You never know, it might lead to a trip to Washington, D.C. later this fall. Ershine Institute Argonauta Scholars would like to commend the following Science Fair alumni, starting with Senior Division Amaya Echeverry, 2019 alum, also Senior Division Om Dhruv, 2020 alum, and Michaela Fisher, 2020 alum, and Morgan Barnes, 2021 alum. These students are previous Earthshine winners and scholarship recipients, and they continue to participate in our fairs. Thank you for providing us with your scientific excellence. We're happy to see you participating in these fairs. This year's Earthshine Institute Argonauta Scholars Award of a certificate and $2,000 scholarship are presented to the following two projects. In the junior division, Mason Huffman, Trafalgar Middle School, and Senior Division Project, Jax Mendelson, Lemon Bay High School. Congratulations, students, on your achievements, and thank you, Earthshine Institute. This year's Florida Association of Science Teachers FAST Award, a certificate, and $25 cash awards are presented to the following projects. From the Junior Division, Nisanyer Gunner, Lehigh Acres Middle School, and Senior Division, Kate Kaplan, Community School of Naples. Congratulations, students, and thank you FAST. Our Florida Power and Light Energy Awards of a certificate and cash awards presented to the following projects. In the Junior Division, Miles Hammond, Mid-Cape Global Academy, a $100 award. Senior Division, Isabel Liu, Dunbar High School, $200 award. And also in the Senior Division, Dhruva Sharma, Fort Myers High School, $200 award. Congratulations to these students, and thank you, Florida Power and Light, for being a longtime supporter. For those of you interested in what State Science Fair looks like, let's watch this video. Each year, students from all over the state attend the State Science and Engineering Fair of Florida. The fair brings together nearly 1,000 of the state's brightest students to showcase projects. These projects within the fields of animal sciences, engineering, microbiology, chemistry, and more are on display by some of the most innovative minds that will certainly be changing our world. Students in both the junior and senior categories showcase inventions and breakthroughs that will fuel not just Florida, but the world into a new place of thought and science. This event is home to over $15,000 in cash prizes for students' excellent projects and well over $1 million in scholarship nominations each and every year. Whether you are a student or a potential sponsor, to learn more about how you can get involved with the State Science and Engineering Fair of Florida, please visit our site today at ssefflorida.com. Our Florida Native Butterfly Society Excellence in Plant Sciences Award of Family Day Passes is presented to all middle school level plant science projects. Congratulations to all of these students for their award-winning projects and thank you to the Florida Native Butterfly Society. This year's Green Wire Technology Solutions Certificate and Cash Awards are presented to the following projects. From the Senior Division, Maya Chandar Canterbury School, a $50 award. Advith Menon, Dunbar High School, $100 award. And also from the Senior Division, Meherine Chowdhury, Canterbury School, a $100 award. Congratulations, students, and thank you to Greenwire Technology Solutions. Our Florida Everblades, four tickets presented to the Junior Division Project of Sabrina Kosmala, St. Andrew Catholic School. Congratulations, Sabrina and thank you to the Florida Everblades. This year's Mu Alpha Theta certificate presented to the following projects. In the Senior Division, 
Jancy Parsa, Dunbar High School, and also in the senior division, Junwei Tan, Lee Virtual School. Congratulations to these two students, and thank you, Mu Alpha Theta. Our Naples Zoo, four general admission passes are presented to the junior division project of Isabel Giddens Trafalgar Middle School. Congratulations, Isabel, and thank you to the Naples Zoo. The NASA Earth System Science Award certificate presented to the following projects. From the junior division, Miles Hammond, and senior division project, Eric Courtney. Congratulations to these two students, and thank you, NASA, for your longtime support. Let's spotlight an Edison Fair finalist. Hi, my name is Maya. I go to Canterbury School and my project was on identifying structural characteristics of Alzheimer's disease and validating my white matter atrophy as an indicator of mild cognitive impairment. And this is a second year study for me. So Alzheimer's disease is one of the top 10 leading causes of death in the world, but it's the only one with no method for prevention or cure. And this is because Alzheimer's disease is a very rapidly progressing uh, disorder. And when patients are diagnosed, it can be very hard to reverse any total brain damage that occurs. But a preliminary memory loss condition that occurs before Alzheimer's disease is called prodromal mild cognitive impairment. And the characteristics, characteristics of prodromal mild cognitive impairment is that first, you see a lot of atrophy in the medial temporal lobe, um, especially in the endorhenal cortex and the hippocampal formation. And then this spreads um, over time to the entire brain and we're able to see total brain atrophy. And part of my hypothesis this year was that white matter atrophy occurs in between the stages of hippocampal atrophy and total brain atrophy. Um, the white matter in the brain starts to destruct before the gray matter does. And this is valuable because having more indicators allows us to better diagnose which stage of prodromal mild cognitive impairment the patient is at and um, allows doctors to diagnose them ahead of time, know their progression, and uh, give them a more personalized treatment plan. So the purpose was to see if white matter atrophy is a significant characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. And I also created an algorithm that was able to delineate between different stages of mild cognitive impairment, early, regular, and late, and also patients who had Alzheimer's disease and cognitively normal patients. And it used risk factors um, that were based off of age, sex, hippocampal atrophy, total brain atrophy, and white matter atrophy in the patient. And my hypothesis was as I stated. So first, I worked with the ADNI initiative at the University of Southern California, and I obtained two T1 weighted sagittal MPRIG images per patient. And I got their ages at each image taken. So the first visit and their last visit at the study. And then I also obtained their sex and using their ages, I was able to find atrophy of, of the structures over time, the hippocampus, the white matter and the total brain. And then I used an automated volumetry system to calculate the volumes of the hippocampus, the total brain and the white matter structures inside of the brain, determine the atrophies. And for the first part of my experiment, I wanted to validate that white matter atrophy was a significant um, was a significant indicator of Alzheimer's disease in prodromal mild cognitive impairment patients. So what I did was I did a multivariate regression model and I was able to see if white matter atrophy significantly um, had a statistically significant relationship with other known indicators of Alzheimer's disease at different stages of um, mild cognitive, prodromal mild cognitive impairment and, then, and that in Alzheimer's disease itself. And I used purposeful selection of covariates to remove values and variables that were um, just not significantly affected by white matter, did not have a significant relationship with white matter atrophy. Created my algorithm using risk factors based off of age, sex, hippocampal, white matter, total brain atrophy. And then I tested my algorithm with a testing data set made up of 55 patients. And overall, to train my algorithm, I used 1,100 pieces of data. So here is just some graphs describing trends in my training data set and my correlation matrices. You can see that white matter has a pretty strong relationship with total brain atrophy uh, throughout time, which supports evidence that white matter atrophy is a significant indicator of um, 
of Alzheimer's disease in mild cognitive impairment patients. Uh, an important thing to notice is that after mild cognitive impairment, in the later stages of mild cognitive impairment and in Alzheimer's disease, the correlation between white matter atrophy and total brain atrophy decreases. And this is because, um, and this is because when it decreases, it's when that total brain atrophy is gonna to start to occur in the patient. So the gray matter is also going to be undergoing atrophy. And uh, this is why the correlation goes down. And then the reason hippocampal atrophy and white matter atrophy don't have a strong relationship or correlation throughout is because is because the hippocampal atrophy is going to occur first and then white matter atrophy is going to occur after and they don't necessarily occur in inversely of each other, which is why they just don't have a strong relationship because then they don't have a direct or inverse relationship. Um, so I ran my multivariate regression model. The reason there are some blanks is because of the purposeful selection of covariates. You can see that white matter atrophy has a pretty strong relationship with most of the indicators, age and gender especially don't affect white matter atrophy. Um, after, especially in the later stages of the disease. And then the hippocampal atrophy and white matter atrophy don't have a strong relationship there. And that's because of um, them not having a strong correlation, as I mentioned before. So I created my algorithm using C Sharp and Visual Studios, and then I did the interface in HTML. And my algorithm used 55 patients and was able to have an accuracy level of 91%. Uh, here's my conclusion, just describing some trends in the training data. And, um, white matter overall. And so in the future, I'd like to use prodromal data to predict the likelihood of mild cognitive impairment patients having prodromal MCI, possibly through graphing, and then look at white matter lesion analysis and using more data. So thank you for your time. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration taking the Pulse of the Planet Award, a letter and certificate presented to the following two projects. From our senior division, Bryce Kronfeld, Estero High School, and Elliot Courtney, Charlotte High School. Congratulations to these two students and thank you Noah for your support of our fairs. This year's Neogenomics Excellence in Cellular Molecular Biology and Biochemistry Award of a plaque and $250 cash award presented to in the senior division Michelle Barnes Canterbury School. Congratulations Michelle and thank you Neogenomics for your support. Our Passarella and Associates Incorporated Ecologist Award of $100 presented to Morgan Barnes, Canterbury School. Congratulations, Morgan, and thank you, Passarella and Associates, for your continued support. This year's Pure Florida Award for Research Excellence of a $200 gift card to Pure Florida are presented to the following projects. In the Senior Division, Elliot Courtney. Junior Division, Owen Zhao. Solomon Edwards, Miles Hazel, Sephora Jean-Pierre, Thor Wickman, Miles Hammond, and from the senior division, Morgan Barnes, Abigail White, and Kendall Williams. Congratulations to all of these students and thank you, Pure Florida, for nearly $2,000 in prizes, but also for your 10-year history of supporting our fairs. We appreciate all that you do. Our RICO Corporation Award for Sustainable Development, a certificate presented to the following projects. Junior Division, Mark Chung, and in the Senior Division, Bianca Trope. Congratulations to these two students, and thank you, RICO, for your support. This year's Society for In Vitro Biology Certificate Award presented to the Senior Division Project from Morgan Barnes. Congratulations, Morgan, and thank you to the Society for In Vitro Biology. Let's take a look at some of the work of our Edison Fairs finalists. Hi, my name is Mason Huffman. I'm in 8th grade and I go to Trafalgar Middle School. My science fair project focuses on thermoacoustic refrigeration systems. Current refrigeration systems use refrigerants such as CFCs, HFCs, and ammonia. The use of these chemicals is the cause for depletion of the ozone layer, which leads to skin cancer, eye damage, and global warming. As much as possible should be done for its development of more environmentally friendly cooling systems. The remote acoustic refrigeration system could be an environmentally friendly alternative to the conventional cooling system. The remote acoustic refrigeration system requires no harmful chemicals in its production and is inexpensive to manufacture. Thermoacoustics are based on the principle 
that sound waves are pressure waves. These sound waves propagate through air via molecular collisions. The molecular collisions cause a disturbance in the air, which in turn creates constructive and destructive interference. The constructive interference causes a molecular compression, and the destructive interference causes a molecular rarefaction. Two types of thermoacoustic refrigeration are possible, that based on the traveling sound wave and the standing wave. The standing wave refrigeration system typically uses the closed end column, a column with one end being closed and the other end being open. The closed end is constrained to be a displacement node and pressure node, antinode, of the standing wave. Here is a fire syringe. When it compresses the air inside the chamber, it undergoes an adiabatic thermodynamic process, one that occurs without loss or gain of heat. As the air's volume is reduced, pressure increases very quickly. The temperature of the air also rises because there is no time for the heat energy to transfer to its surroundings, as would normally happen. This increase in temperature can cause flammable substances to ignite with hot air alone. Here is a video that demonstrates the concept described. The main components of the thermoacoustic refrigerator are a resonator tube, speaker, and a fourth component called a stack. Generating acoustic waves through a driver, such as a loudspeaker, makes the gas resonate. When a sound wave travels down the tube, alternating compression and rarefaction of the gas causes the temperature of the gas to oscillate. At the pressure antinode, the temperature of the gas becomes higher than that of the stack wall. Heat is transferred from the gas to the stack wall. The temperature of the top part of the stack increases and the temperature of the gas drops. As the temperature of the gas drops below that of the stack wall, heat is transferred from the wall to the gas. The temperature of the bottom part of the stack decreases. The result is a temperature gradient where the top of the stack is hot and the bottom is cold. In my experiment, I investigated the effect of frequency, stack material, and geometry on the performance of the thermoacoustic refrigeration system. Additionally, the influence of the stack length and stack center position on the behavior of the cooling system were investigated. A 9-inch and 11-inch plastic container were utilized as a sound chamber. A hole in both containers' lids was cut to fit a 4-inch 40, 40-watt 40 speaker. A hole was drilled through the plywood to fit the acrylic tube. The acrylic tube with length of 87 centimeters and diameter of 3.5 centimeters was used as quarter wavelength resonator, so that it has 100 hertz of resonance frequency, as you can see in my calculations here. A twin probe thermocouple was used to measure temperatures inside the stack. Probe 1 was placed 2 millimeters from the base of the stack. Probe 2 was placed 2 millimeters from the top of the stack. A rubber stopper was used at the end of the stack to keep any air from escaping the tube slash chamber. A hole was drilled in the side of the 11-inch container so a, so a speaker wire could be fed through. The speaker wire was connected to the speaker and a tone generator. In my experiment, I fabricated several types of stack configurations, such as Mylar parallel stack, 1 mm aluminum spiral stack, 1 mm PET spiral stack, and a 1 mm mylar spiral stack. I also fabricated 7 mm honeycomb polypropylene stack, 5 mm honeycomb polypropylene stack, and lastly, 3 mm honeycomb polypropylene stack. The stack center was positioned at 22 centimeters and at, from the closed end so as to be close to the pressure antinode. The 40 watt acoustic driver played frequencies ranging from 60 hertz to 300 hertz with a 20 hertz step and a maximum amplitude at 87 decibels. Each frequency was played for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, each experiment was repeated five times with surrounding temperature at 77 degrees Fahrenheit.
Before the next trial, both ends of the stack were cooled off to room temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperatures from the lower and upper end of the stack were measured with thermal couples, and the data was recorded on an Excel spreadsheet. For each stack material, the temperature difference was the greatest for the frequency of 100 Hz, as you can see for all seven stacks. The most optimal stack type was 3 mm honeycomb polypropylene stack, resulting in 37.5 degrees Fahrenheit temperature difference between the stack ends. I also investigated the influence of stack length and stack center position on the temperature difference between the stack ends. 3 mm honeycomb polypropylene stacks were made for four variations in lengths, 5 cm, 7.5 cm, 10 cm, and 12.5 cm, with inner diameter of 3.5 cm. The center of the stack was placed at seven positions, varying from 25.5 cm to 13.5 cm. The resonance frequency of 100 Hz was played for 10 minutes. The temperatures from the lower and upper end of the stack was measured with thermocouples. Before the next trial, both ends of the stack were cooled off to room temperature. This process was repeated for all stack lengths for five trials. Here is a graph of all four stack lengths at seven stack positions ranging from 13.5 cm to 25.5 cm. These results show the optimum distance of stack center from closed end for each stack length. Stack length is an important variable affecting the performance of thermoacoustic system. There is an optimum value of stack length, which is 10 cm, which gave temperature difference of 46.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Here is one of the trials for a 10 cm stack that was set at 17.5 cm. This is the temperature of the upper part of the stack, which is 100.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the temperature of the bottom part of the stack, which is 51.4 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature difference for this trial was 49.4 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a piece of thermal tape that, was, that represents the temperature gradient between both ends of the stack. In this research, air was used as a working fluid. For future research, other inert gases with higher sound velocity may increase the temperature of the thermoacoustic refrigerator performance. The shape of the resonator tube, such as conical or spherical, may also improve the, uh, may also improve the performance of the thermoacoustic system. Thank you for viewing my presentation, and I hope you enjoyed it. This year's University of Florida Thompson Earth Systems Institute, a $100 gift card is presented to the Senior Division Project of Morgan Barnes. Congratulations, Morgan, and thank you to the UF Thompson Earth Systems Institute. The U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, Certificate and Social Media Toolkit is presented to the following Senior Division Projects, Megan D'Souza and Amaya Echeverry. Congratulations to these two students, and thank you, USAID, for your support. This year's U.S. Metric Association Award for Best Use of the International System of Units, a certificate award presented to the Senior Division Projects of Michaela Fisher and Olivia Sills. Congratulations to these two students, and thank you, USMA. This year's United States Air Force Certificate Awards presented to the following Senior Division Projects, Laura Kendall and the Team Project of Alm Dhruv and Nicholas Hardy. Congratulations to these two students and thank you to the United States Air Force. This year's Stockholm Junior Water Prize Certificate Awards presented to the following Senior Division Projects, Elliot Courtney, Miles Hazel, Morgan Barnes, Abigail White, Kendall Williams, and Eric Courtney. Congratulations to these, two, these fine students, and thank you, Stockholm Junior Water Prize. The Yale Science and Engineering Association Certificate and Letter Award presented to the following senior division projects, Morgan Barnes and Michelle Barnes. Congratulations to both of these students, and thank you to the Yale Science and Engineering Association. This year's Scientist Society of Southwest Florida Award for Excellence in Junior Science, $50 cash awards presented to each of the following students. 
Tanish Madhar, Sophia Mayas, Lauren Friedman, Jancy Parsa, Laura Kendall, Advith Menon, Dhruva Sharma, Om Dhruv and Nicholas Hardy, and Michelle Barnes. Congratulations to these students and thank you to the Scientist Society of Southwest Florida for not just judging our fairs, but also providing this special award contribution. The National Geographic Society, that's Geography, Cultivating Empathy for the Earth Award, a $100 award and certificate presented to the following project. In the senior division, Megan D'Souza, Community School of Naples. Congratulations, Megan, and thank you, National Geographic Society. This year's Marie Glasgow AAUW Memorial Scholarship Award, a $500 award, is presented to the following student. From our junior division, Sarah Engel, St. Andrew Catholic School. Congratulations, Sarah, and a special thank you to Mr. Ron Glasgow and the Foundation for Lee County Public Schools for assisting in administering this award. Our Regeneron Science to Medicine Biomedical Science Award, a $500 award and certificate presented to the following project. In the senior division, Lara Kendall, Canterbury School. Congratulations, Lara and thank you, Regeneron. Our Florida Southwestern State College two-year academic scholarship, valued at $2,000, is presented to the following project. In the senior division, Eric Courtney, Charlotte High School. Congratulations, Eric, and thank you, Florida Southwestern State College. Let's take a look at one of our Edison Fairs finalists. Hi, everyone. It's an honor for us to be up here. My name is Om Drew. And my name is Nicholas Hardy and we are both in 11th grade. Ever since we were in middle school, we both had an interest in the medical field and engineering field. This is what gave rise to our project, comparing the efficiency of novel point of care approaches to identifying specific stages of diabetic retinopathy through the use of low cost neural networks and novel deep learning solutions. To provide context, diabetic retinopathy is a complication caused by an existing history of diabetes that can slowly deteriorate a person's vision and can even lead to potential blindness. Often the diabetic complication can be treated by modern laser eye treatments. However, when left untreated, its effects seemingly take on worse results over time. These severe cases are often seen in developing nations where general access to medical testing is bleak, with most patients unsure of their severity until physical implications become apparent. In fact, 79% of the adults with diabetes reside within low to middle income nations and serve a major risk of joining the estimated 93 million people worldwide suffering from diabetic retinopathy. Without significant medical testing, which can often prove expensive, this population is at the most at risk of developing blindness and suffering the consequences of vision impairment. In this sense, the recent development of low-cost neural networks as a means of detecting early stages of diabetic retinopathy has become a much-needed solution. The recognition methods we compared were CNN, which stands for Convolutional Neural Network, and KNN, which stands for K-Nearest Neighbors. The CNN algorithm processes features regardless of spatial orientation because of its utilization of kernels that process training images. It also uses higher computational power in its training processes as it cycles through multiple convolutional layers as well as the refinement of its features through a series of epochs. On the other hand, KNN identifies features based upon color intensity and takes spatial orientation into account when classifying testing images. KNN trains upon its sample data set by conforming the data into logic-based matrices which require little computational power as it simply is building a record for later classification. However, such solutions must be made accessible as well as accurate in their results. This is the basis for our experiment and the reason for such urgency when it comes to developing solutions. This led us to our research question. What is the accuracy of convolutional neural network algorithms compared to K-nearest neighbors algorithms over different training sample sizes in identifying specific stages of diabetic retinopathy severity in retinal images. We hypothesized this. If we develop deep learning algorithms of equal constraints and processes to identify specific stages 
of DR, then CNN will produce greater mean accuracy across higher training sample sizes in its identification process compared to KNN, which will produce greater mean accuracy across lower training sample sizes. Our null hypothesis stated that there would be no statistical significance between the type of algorithm and its mean accuracy. Using data from IPANX, we trained the KNN and CNN neural networks on random samples of 25, 50, 75, 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500 for each stage. After training, we began experimentation. In each trial, a random sample of 25 images was tested on trained neural networks for both models for a total of 10 trials. This process was duplicated for each severity level in total to utilize 1,250 images in testing with a combination of 50 net trials over the five severities. The results would be two radar graphs that display the area exchange across the change in training sample sizes within each individual DR severity, two line graphs in which one displays a mean accuracy comparison and the other a buffered accuracy comparison, and tables with all values displayed. When presenting with training sample sizes of 125 and 250 retinal images, CANN was more accurate, which could justify its use over CNN in lower sample sizes. However, training sample sizes of 375 and above, CNN was more accurate, which could justify its use over CANN in higher sample sizes. This supported our hypothesis. Since the CNN algorithm produced a greater average accuracy across higher training sample sizes in this identification process, compared to the KNN algorithm, which produced greater average accuracy across lower training sample sizes. At the largest training sample size of 2,500 retinal images, the CNN was over 6% higher in accuracy compared to KNN. This could signify that CNN's accuracy would continue growing at a higher rate with additional training samples, which could prove to be beneficial to larger researchers with worldwide resources. As for statistical analysis, we performed a two-way ANOVA with a significance level of 0.05. For each training sample size, all of the p-values from the ANOVA test were less than the significance level, which meant our null hypothesis was rejected, confirming the results were statistically significant. These results concur with the community of global issues for which this study was conducted upon. The research and findings of this study will directly aid low-income exhibitions that seek widespread testing for the preventable disease that is diabetic retinopathy. With the data in relation to KNN and CNN, we have provided some certainty to the usage of such efficient algorithms within medical testing. Although ambiguity still lies in the perfection of accuracy within the two computing models, we have provided a defining line between the necessary usage of KNN and CNN in the field. When granted further retinal samples, this study recommends the development of a convolutional neural network to best discern between DR severities. However, when granted fewer retinal samples, this study suggests K-nearest neighbors as the more accurate, although not precise, algorithm to best discern between DR severities. With this in mind, our second year study will explore the external factors of retinal imaging through physical experimentation that was inaccessible during the global pandemic. Not only will this project and our further research bridge the gap between technology and preventable retinal diseases, but it'll also offer a lasting improvement to people all across the globe. Thank you to Dr. Nelson, Dr. Polk, and Mrs. Chu for their support, and thank you for your time. And our final special award is the Southwest Florida Community Foundation, James D. and Eleanor F. Newton Scholar. This award is handed out annually to a junior division project or projects that strive for excellence. This year's $2,000 scholarship, renewable for $500 a year for up to four years, is a tie and is going to be presented to Curacula Soraya Fernando and Mason Huffman. Congratulations to these two students and thank you to the Southwest Florida Community Foundation for your support. Don't forget, you can share and celebrate your special award success on our social media pages, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, using the hashtag Edison Fairs. Category Place Awards are presented based on round one online judging. This year's category awards include honorable mention, medals presented to students, 
as well as trophies for third place awards, second place awards, and first place category awards. We'd like to first congratulate all of our Animal Sciences Regional Finalists in both the Junior and Senior Division. Beginning with our Animal Science Third Place Awards are presented to Junior Division, Aubrey Schur, Charlotte Preparatory School, and Junior Division, Rafael Varela, St. Andrew Catholic School. Second Place Animal Sciences Awards are presented to Junior Division, Emma Kramer, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, and Junior Division, Isabel Giddens, Trafalgar Middle School. And our Animal Sciences First Place Award is presented to Junior Division, Celia Ibanez Garner, Calusa Middle School. Congratulations to all of these students on your Animal Sciences achievements. Let's check in on this student's project. Hello everyone, my name is Carolyn Garrett and I'm really excited to share with you my project called Bioplastics from Banana Peels. So I'm going to get my presentation set up. Here is an overview of my board. I'm going to break down each section of it. So the purpose of this research was to discover which type of banana yielded the strongest bioplastic. Now bioplastic is starch based, unlike the synthetic plastics that you see at the store that are made from petroleum oil. Um, and as we know, synthetic plastics are very harmful for aquatic life in our waterways. So by creating an eco-friendly bioplastic, I aim to mitigate these problems. Additionally, little to no research has compared multiple types of bananas and their bioplastics they produce. Um, additionally, no research that I have come across has explored the plantain hybrid Musa acuminata ex Musa balpiciana and the dwarf manzano banana. My alternative hypothesis is if the plantain hybrid contains greater starch content than Manzano and Chiquita bananas, then this plantain will yield the strongest bioplastic because its higher level of starch will allow for more starch retrogradation and gelatinization. So what starch retrogradation means is that the amylopectin molecules, which are associated with starch formation, they crystallize and um, when they become more compact, this creates a stronger bioplastic. And gelatinization um, increases the viscosity of the banana paste, which allows for a more dura durable bioplastic as well. Variables and constants. So the dependent variable in my experiment was bioplastic strength, which was measured in K-PAW. The independent variable was the type of banana peel. And the controls um, were kept constant, such as temperature, bake time, and volume. materials. So I'd like to point out that I used glycerol, which is extremely important in aiding in gelatinization. Um, and this allows for ultimately a more flexible bioplastic as well. And then I also use sodium metabisulfite or Na2S2O5, which is extremely important because it is a preservative. And without a preservative, the bioplastic would deteriorate very quickly. So it is very important to include both of these materials when making a bioplastic from banana peels. Here's a brief procedure. I'm not gonna go into too much depth, but I'd like to point out that I put the banana peels in a blender. So this allowed me to create a very un uniform um, banana paste that was baked at 375 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can read through my procedure um, later if you would like. So here are some process photos that I included. So you could just get a visual of what I did. So here are the peels soaking in the preservative. And then here are the peels drying after they boiled as well. And then this is what the final product looked like. So as you can tell, the shapes of the bioplastics are irregular, which of course introduces a source of air, um, which of course is a limitation to my project as well. However, I did try to reduce air as much as possible by using the same measurement each time. So I used one tablespoon of the banana paste and spread it over um, a rectangle on the parchment paper. 
So I used a fruit penetrometer to obtain my values um, in KPAW. So what a fruit penetrometer does is it punctures the bioplastic and it ultimately measures material failure. So the higher the KPAW value, the stronger the bioplastic. Um, so I ran a single factor ANOVA test among the groups and the p-value generated was 8.4 times 10 to the negative eighth, which is statistically significant, less than 0 0.05. So this um, indicated to me that plantains had the strongest bioplastic. And then because the Chiquita Manzano's values were so similar, I decided to run a statistical t-test on them. However, there was no statistical difference found. And as you can see, the plantain strength is almost double that of the Manzano and Chiquita, which is pretty impressive. And then I also incorporated the values um, that were originally obtained just so you could get a visual of what they looked like. So to reiterate, it is very important to create an eco-friendly bioplastic to preserve our planet. Um, and also just to mitigate the problems with aquatic life and their suffering. And a plausible idea for future research is to compare the bioplastic of banana peels to that of other starchy vegetables, namely potatoes would be a plausible candidate. However, I decided to choose banana peels because they're typically thrown away. And I figured why not put them towards something more resourceful? Another plausible idea would be, a, be excuse me, to create a hybrid bioplastic mixed with synthetic plastics. Um, and this would allow for a bit more of a durable bioplastic, which could be used for straws or other cups, etc. So I want to thank you so much for listening to my present today, my presentation today. I greatly appreciate you taking the time of your day to listen. Thank you so much. Moving now to behavioral and social sciences finalists, we'd like to congratulate all of these students for making it to regional science fair in the junior and senior divisions. Behavioral and Social Sciences Honorable Mentions are presented to Junior Division Projects, Imoni Ahmad, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School, Olivia Langsberg, Charlotte Preparatory School, and Nusha Patel, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School, as well as Senior Division Project, Kate Kaplan, Community School of Naples. Third place Behavioral and Social Sciences Awards are presented to Junior Division Projects, Ambriel Calixte Day, Mariner Middle School, and Orlando Fernandez, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School. Also in the Senior Division, Anika Coca, Canterbury School. For second place, Behavioral and Social Sciences Awards are presented to the Junior Division projects of Natalia Bendek, Three Oaks Middle School, and Margaret Swift, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School and in the senior division, Ava Broadhead, Estero High School. And this year's Behavioral Social Sciences First Place Category Awards are presented to junior division, Abian Malik, Cresswell School, and senior division, Junwei Tan, Lee Virtual School. Congratulations to all of these students on their success in behavioral and social sciences. Moving now to biomedical and health sciences, We'd like to congratulate all of these students for being regional science fair finalists in the junior and senior divisions. Honorable mention in biomedical and health sciences is presented to senior division project, a team project of Gavin Clark, Shania Arani, and Anthony Principato, Charlotte Preparatory School. Third place biomedical and health sciences award presented to the junior division project from Charlie Della Luna, Oak Hammock Middle School, and in the Senior Division, Bianca Trope, Community School of Naples. Second place, Biomedical and Health Sciences Awards are presented to, in the Junior Division, Jackson Moaning, Charlotte Preparatory School, and in the Senior Division, the team project of Kira Ritter and Jeffrey Stevens, Estero High School, and Madison White, Estero High School. First place, Biomedical and Health Sciences Awards are presented to, in the Junior Division, Kaylee Della Luna, Oak Hammock Middle School, and Senior Division, Laura Kendall, Canterbury School. Congratulations to all of these students on their place awards in Biomedical and Health Sciences. 
Join me now as we learn about some of our students' projects. Hi, my name is Laura Kendall, and today I'll be discussing the viability of pure mushroom-derived chitosan as an alternative to pure crustacean-derived chitosan in hemostatic agents. To begin, accidental trauma is the leading cause of death in Americans aged 1 to 44. Such accidental trauma is usually accompanied by hemorrhaging or acute blood loss. This acute blood loss can often be stopped via the application of a tourniquet. However, in cases of arterial bleeding or cases in which the injury is on the body cavity, a tourniquet cannot be applied. In such situations, hemostatic granules, such as Celox, are applied to stop the bleed. Celox is based on crustacean-derived chitosan, which is acquired from the shells of crustaceans such as lobsters and crabs. The shells are then washed and crushed, demineralized, deprotonated, and decolorized to form chitin. That chitin is then treated with an alkaline substance such as sodium hydroxide to form the white powder shown at the bottom of the screen, chitosan. However, there are many downsides to crustacean-derived chitosan. It is extremely expensive and complicated to make and not environmentally sustainable, as the use of crab and lobster shells leads to a problem with overfishing. In addition, individuals with shellfish allergies have expressed concerns that the product may cause allergic reactions when applied to them. These concerns have not been researched extremely thoroughly. My research set out to determine whether mushroom-derived chitosan from the fungus Agaricus bisphorus could be used as an alternative to crustacean-derived chitosan in hemostatic agents. I hypothesized that because crustacean-derived chitosan and fungi-derived chitosan have the same biological composition, they would have similar or comparable clotting times and solubilities in water. In order to run the clot time test, I applied 0.2 milliliters of heparinized rat blood to 0.5 grams of the different arrays of chitosan using the crustacean-derived chitosan as a negative control and the Celox granules as a positive control. It was then timed how long it took for the, clot, the blood to fully clot and recorded. In order to test the solubilities of the chitosan, it had to be treated via a novel method, which allowed the substance to dissolve into deionized water and form a gel. So this method involved dissolving the powder into acetic acid and then using centrifugation to remove any excess sediment. The remaining solution was then treated in ammonium hydroxide and then underwent centrifugation again to yield a precipitant. The precipitant was then dried and formed the chitosan flakes shown in the bottom right of the screen. In order to run the solubility tests, seven milligrams of the flakes were placed in 0.5 milliliters of deionized water and it was timed how long it took for the flakes to fully dissolve. As you can see, the averages between the treated mushroom-derived chitosan and treated crustacean-derived chitosan are remarkably similar. Two-tailed t-tests were used to determine the statistical significance of the results. When comparing the clot times of the mushroom-derived chitosan versus the clot times of the crustacean-derived chitosan, a p-value of 0.336639 was yielded, meaning that there was not a statistical significantly difference between the two. However, when comparing the clot times of the mushroom chitosan versus the Celox granules, a p-value of 0 0.002484 was yielded, meaning that there was a statistically significant difference between the two, and that mushroom-derived chitosan in its purified form was actually a more effective hemostatic agent than the Celox hemostatic granules on a milligram to milliliter basis. A, a t-test concerning the solubility of the mushroom chitosan versus the crustacean chitosan yielded a p-value of 0.983842, meaning that there was not a statistically significant difference between the two in the six either, and that the researcher's hypothesis was correct. So essentially, it can be concluded that mushroom-derived chitosan is comparable to crustacean-derived chitosan in terms of clot time and solubility. <laughs> so why is this important? Well, mushroom-derived chitosan is much less expensive than its crustacean-derived chitosan counterpart at about $20 less per 100 grams. In addition, it is much more environmentally sustainable as agaricus bisphorus is biocompatible and biodegradable. In addition, the mushrooms can be grown in a dark room rather than being obtained via overfishing of the oceans. In addition, because there is no shellfish component to the mushroom-derived chitosan, both the shellfish allergies need not feel concerned using the product. The solubility times yielded by this experiment also conclude that both types of chitosan would be effective in liquid hemostats, which is the direction that hemostatic agent companies are aiming to go in the future, in which a liquid hemostat could be poured onto a wound rather than just applied topically. 
Essentially, the research showed that mushroom-derived chitosan may well be a viable alternative to crustacean-derived chitosan in hemostatic agents moving forward. Thank you. We'd like to congratulate the following projects for being regional finalists in cellular molecular biology and biochemistry. Second place award for cellular molecular biology and biochemistry is presented to Sophia Rosansky, Estero High School. And first place award in cellular molecular biology and biochemistry is presented to Michelle Barnes, Canterbury School. Congratulations to these students on your success in this year's science fair. We'd like to congratulate all of these students for being selected as regional chemistry finalists in the junior division, as well as the senior division. Starting with third place category awards in chemistry, we'd like to present the following awards to junior division projects. Isabella Tamayo Braseno, Mariner Middle School, Keseline Mesador, the Alva School, and Nankuli Rousseau, Mid-Cape Global Academy. Second place chemistry awards are presented to, in the junior division, Caleb Donnelly, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, and Adam Kornack, Cresswell School. And in the senior division, Sophie Perkins, Estero High School. First place chemistry category awards are presented to, in the junior division, Caroline Hathaway, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School. And from our senior division, Chloe Vong and Kenzie Girard, Riverdale High School. Congratulations to all of these students for their excellence in the category of chemistry. Here's a video from the Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair. Welcome everyone to the 2021 Virtual Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair. We are gathered here to celebrate the world's best and brightest young scientists and engineers. ISEF is the world's largest science competition for high school students. I'm so pleased and proud to share that this is our biggest ISEF ever. With 1,471 projects, we have more projects being judged than ever before. This is a momentous occasion, the beginning of a big week for the future of science. Everybody line up. Go! Go! I felt that virtual ISEF was just a really good opportunity to not only speak to other people, but also share my research with such acclaimed judges and peers around the world. Oh, good questions. Do you want to exchange pins? Nice to meet you. Nah, yeah, nice to meet you. Participating in ISA was, I think, a life-changing event. One of my favorite parts is seeing all of the people from around the world with their different stories and their passion for all of their unique and incredible projects. The special awards provides a unique opportunity for organizations to recognize and encourage achievements by young people in the STEM fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Welcome to the Excellence in Science and Technology panel. I can't tell all of you how thrilled I am to be moderating this social innovation panel. Science is changing so fast, so what's most important is to have the confidence that you can change. You are empowered to really change the trajectory of science. There are so many opportunities out there. Stay true to yourself and don't do what others think is the right thing for you. You have to be doing the right thing for yourself. What was it that made Newton and Faraday and Maxwell and Einstein so great? Two things, they had a curiosity to understand the universe and they had a passion and the willpower to push it through. It is my honor to present to you the top award winners of the 2021 Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair. So actually, all of the Michigan competitors got together at a theater. So when I, my name was called, everyone was clapping and congratulating me. So it felt really good and I felt really happy that my achievements were recognized. This is where we find the science heroes of the future who will lead humanity's fight against so many global threats, from pandemics to climate change. Right here at Regeneron ISEP, where we are united by the common goal of engaging, inspiring, and celebrating. 
the talented young scientists who will use their scientific superpowers to improve the world. The Science Fair community has always been a breeding ground for trailblazers, people looking beyond the boundaries of what everyone thinks is possible. All of our sponsors are also trailblazers. I'm so grateful that they shared in our vision of hosting a virtual ISEF competition and made a big bet on us. Thank you. And remember, you are part of the vanguard. You are the people who change all of society and human history. Good luck. We'd like to congratulate the following students for being selected as regional finalists in Earth and Environmental Sciences. From our junior division, congratulations to these students. And congratulations to the following senior division finalists. Honorable mention in Earth and Environmental Sciences are presented to the following projects. From the junior division, Bridget Johnston, Three Oaks Middle School. Elsie Cribbs, Benita Springs Middle Center for the Arts. And from our senior division, Eric Courtney, Charlotte High School. Third place, Earth and Environmental Sciences Awards are presented to, from our junior division, Ariana Thomas, Three Oaks Middle School, and Solomon Edwards, St. Andrew Catholic School. Second place category awards are presented to Mark Chung, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, and Shuniska Mehta, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School, and from the senior division, Abigail White, Cypress Lake High School. And this year's first place Earth and Environmental Sciences Awards are presented to the following projects. From the Junior Division, Kurakula Soraya Fernando, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School, Tanish Madhar, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School, and from our Senior Division, Jax Mendelson, Lemon Bay High School, and Morgan Barnes, Canterbury School. Congratulations to all of these projects for their success in Earth and Environmental Sciences. We'd like to congratulate the following junior and senior division projects for being selected as finalists in Engineering and Material Sciences. Honorable Mention Awards in Engineering are presented to the following projects. From our junior division, Miles Brown, Three Oaks Middle School, and senior division, Druma Sharma, Fort Myers High School. Third place category awards in engineering are presented to, from the junior division, Jacob Pomerantz, Charlotte Preparatory School, and senior division project, the team project of Jamie Lee and Bre Brendan Welsh, Estero High School. Second place engineering awards are presented to, from the junior division, Caden Kellum, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, and the senior division project of Miles Hazel, Charlotte High School. And this year's first place engineering category awards in junior division presented to Miles Hammond, Mid Cape Global Academy, and senior division, Caroline Guerra, Community School of Naples. We'd like to congratulate all of these students for their awards in engineering and material science. Let's take a look at some of the work of our Edison Fairs finalists. Hello, my name is Bryce Grenfell and I'm a junior from Estero High School. I studied the creation and sustainability of a symbiotic atmosphere in relation to surface area. For my preliminary background research, I studied aerobic respiration and its relation to photosynthesis. I studied the photosynthetic parts of plants, um, the photosynthetic ingredients and how plants undergo photosynthesis. I studied aerobic respiration and how mammals, in this case mice or moose musculus, intake those photosynthetic byproducts and utilize them for aerobic respiration and how that affects their bodies. I studied the behavior of mice and how to care for them in both a living and a lab setting, and I use my previous year's research to prepare for this year's experiment as it is a continuation project. My hypothesis was that if the ability of these three freshwater plants, Agaria densa, Agagar pilulinae, and Jacana cinderiana, to maintain a mutually beneficial atmosphere within an enclosed environment is tested, then Agaria densa will be able to sustain these conditions for the longest period of time due to its increased surface area. My procedures began by running some base trials with the mice. This is the enclosure that the mice were housed in during the experiment. It's not fully set up right now as I'm not running an experiment. Two mice were placed in and this oxygen monitor, which measures the percentage of oxygen in relation to other gases within the enclosure. Uh, the starting point was around 
0 0.4 to 22.6% oxygen, and I measured the amount of time it took for the percentage of oxygen to go from that starting point to below 19%, which is the beginnings of a potentially hazardous situation for the mice, but not technically dangerous yet. For my actual experimentation, I used this vacuum chamber and depressurized it using this vacuum pump to around 100 pascals. Um, I inserted pure carbon dioxide until the, pump, the vacuum chamber was at a pressure of around one atmospheric pressure again. I turned these UV grow lights on, allowing the plants that were previously selected out of these three species and water to photosynthesize. The lights were then turned off to allow them to release gases. And during that 20 minute period, the mass enclosure along with the mice where it was set up and connected to the valves. The pumps were turned on, the enclosure was closed, and after the 20 minutes were up, the lights were turned back on for the remainder of the experiment, and the valves were opened, creating a circular airflow, allowing for the creation of an atmosphere. I found the time the same way I did the base trials. I measured the amount of time it took for the percentage of oxygen within the mice enclosure to go from the starting point to below 19%, which is again, the beginnings of a potentially hazardous situation, but not dangerous yet. After the experiment was over, I converted that timeline cut to seconds, and then I divided it by the surface area of these plants that were placed within, giving me centimeters or seconds per centimeter squared, which is one of my main sources of data. My conclusion was that Agaria densa was able to sustain these conditions for the longest amount of time, proving my hypothesis to be valid. This is most likely due to the fact that it has the greatest amount of stomata, allowing for the fastest and most efficient rate of gas exchange between the plants, which is how the mice breathe, and how the oxygen was put into the container. And it has the greatest amount of chloroplast and chlorophyll, allowing for faster and more efficient photosynthesis within the plant. This research is important, as it can help solve the global climate crisis today by allowing us to focus on the most important plants instead of less efficient, maybe more expensive plants when we could be focusing on these to spread around the entire world. It can be used in space travel today, uh, in space capsules or stations, as an alternate, maybe cheaper, lighter payload, easier to manage form of oxygen production instead of electrolysis. And it can be used in the near or distant future for the creation of atmospheres either within a biodome on another planet or to create an actual atmosphere within another planet. Next, we'd like to congratulate all the regional finalists in the Junior and Senior Division of Environmental Engineering. Honorable mention at Environmental Engineering Awards are presented to, in the Junior Division, Thor Wickman, Charlotte Virtual School, and Sephra Esperance, St. Andrew Catholic School, and from the Senior Division, Megan D'Souza, Community School of Naples. Third place category awards in environmental engineering are presented to, from the junior division, Kaylee Montgomery, Mariner Middle School, and the senior division project from Elliott Courtney, Charlotte High School. Second place environmental engineering awards are presented to, from the junior division, Swearin Korzik, Trafalgar Middle School, and senior division, Michaela Fisher, Canterbury School. And our first place category awards in environmental engineering are presented to Sarah Engel, St. Andrew Catholic School, and Isabel Liu, Dunbar High School. Congratulations to all of these students for their success in environmental engineering. We'd like to congratulate all of the junior division and senior division projects that made it to regional science fair in the category of intelligent machines, robotics, and systems software. This year's third place category awards are presented to the following projects. From the junior division, Landon Melton, St. Andrew Catholic School, and the senior division, Meherine Chowdhury, Canterbury School. Second place category awards are presented to Zaid Al-Salman, Cresswell School, and Advith Menon, Dunbar High School. And this year's first place category awards in Intelligent Machines Robotics Systems Software are presented to Leah Chung, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, and the team project of Am Dhruv and Nicholas Hardy, Fort Myers High School. Congratulations to all of these students on their success in the category of Intelligent Machines, Robotics, and Systems Software. Let's spotlight an Edison Fair finalist. 
Hi, my name is Junwei Tan, and this is my project, addressing barriers to classroom communication by automating student to educator feedback loops through a novel software-based approach. Effective classroom communication goes hand in hand with effective instruction. Student comprehension and confidence are key elements of student perception that educators must understand to ensure that their students gain the most out of a lesson. However, students often feel that they are unable to express their perception of instruction during lessons, leaving educators with a lack of this critical information. This leads to a growing gap between the two groups as the lesson continues, which leads to lost time and resources. To understand this issue further, literature review and interviews with students and educators were conducted. It was identified that the main obstacles to educators gaining lesson level feedback from students include social dynamics among peers and teachers, as well as limited opportunities for feedback, such as through a lack of prompting. Fragmented feedback results from reliance on insufficient sources or tools and further divides students and educators, making students feel disconnected from the class. When this occurs, comprehension, engagement, and confidence suffers. The goal of this research was to develop a software-based approach that would address this problem by accomplishing these goals and within these constraints. Prototype software was developed based on observations and interviews conducted at the beginning of this study. The, this prototype was then presented to focus groups for end-user feedback, and a minimally viable product, or NVP, called Muddiest Point was developed. This NVP was then deployed in field tests, which we identified as a context which have been the most challenging application that still fits the scope of this research, an upper elementary school classroom. There was a total of 100 participants, students spread across a control and test group. Both students would take on an initial assessment to establish their confidence and comprehension of the subject material beforehand. They would then go through a lesson with the test group using the Money's Point software and a control group having no additional materials. Afterward, they were given the same assessment and the change in these metrics was calculated. This is the basic interface that students would interact with. Right here are the tiles that students could select to indicate a status. Uh, these uh, tiles include more examples needed, speed up, slow down. They would be able to see a number of how many other students have selected that tile as well. Over here, they will be able to freely type a muddiest point, which can be a comment or specific question. Students can then upvote or downvote these things to indicate their agreement with it. Students also have the option to be anonymous when posting a muddiest point, which addresses the issue of social dynamics that we uh, identified earlier. So through a two-tailed independent t-test, we have identified that there was a statistically significant difference between the comprehension and confidence of the control and test group uh, before and after. The delta conf represents the change in confidence and the delta comp represents the change in comprehension. There was also a significant SMD, which indicates that there is a, a relatively large uh, effect that Muddiest Point was able to have. Uh, this is especially true with comprehension, uh, and we expect this to be even bigger with uh, confidence um, in other scenarios where uh, you know, longer term studies or in higher education. On comments of adoption, we can see uh, students, when they were asked, would they use this tool if it was available in the classroom? Uh, the vast majority, 94%, said either yes or maybe. Um, and a very large uh, majority of them said yes. This is uh, under consideration that this is the first time they've ever encountered this software. And this type of adoption uh, indicates that this is a very severe and important issue for the students. Um, over time, we would expect adoption to increase even further as we move forward. Here are some of the comments that students made about uh, anything they wanted to say related to the software. As you can see that many of them saw um, that this addressed the issues that we identified earlier. Here are some of the qualitative observations uh, presented by the educator who was administering this class. Uh, as we can see, the control group often was distracted, um, and the test group was, even though they had the iPads which they were using to use the software on, were not really distracted by them, um, and were able to be a lot more uh, focused on the lesson. 
The software that we have programmed was now going to be distributed through a new uh, software venture founded by the researcher. Um, we can use it to optimize live lesson adjustments as well as lesson planning using the feedback that we receive. Now this effect will be further multiplied as we investigate its applications in higher education levels. Uh, this includes high school, college, um, and potentially some other applications. We can look at longer term effects of this software and different contexts and that will allow us to gain further insights into this software, make further improvements, and be able to make a larger impact. Thank you all for your time. Uh, my name is Jinwei Tan and this has been uh, the Money's Point Software. Congratulations to these students for being regional finalists in mathematics and computational sciences. Honorable Mention Place Award is presented to the Junior Division Project from Ella Courtney, Punta Gorda Middle School. Second Place Category Award in Mathematics and Computational Sciences is presented to Jancy Parsa, Dunbar High School. And a First Place Category Award in Mathematics and Computational Sciences is presented to Maya Chandar, Canterbury School. Congratulations to all of these students on their success in Mathematics and Computational Sciences. Next, we'd like to recognize all of these students for being regional finalists in the junior and senior divisions of microbiology. Third place category awards are presented to the following projects. In the junior division, Fatima Alvarado, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, and the senior division project from Stephen Pham, Estero High School. Second place award in microbiology is presented to the junior division project from Gabriel Cintron, St. Michael Lutheran School. And first place category awards in microbiology are presented to, from the junior division, Nisanyer Gunner, Lehigh Acres Middle School. And in the senior division, Amaya Echeverry, Community School of Naples, and John Cintron, Fort Myers High School. Congratulations to all of these students for their success in microbiology. We'd like to congratulate all of these students for being finalists in the junior and senior divisions of physics and astronomy. Honorable mention in physics and astronomy is presented to the junior division project from Cooper Vandermeer, Benita Springs Middle Center for the Arts. Third place category awards in physics and astronomy are presented to Ishan Adi, Canterbury School, Layla Hornsby, Veterans Park Academy for the Arts, and in the senior division, Boone Stewart, Riverdale High School. Second place physics and astronomy place awards are presented to Sophia Mayes, St. Andrew Catholic School, Taylor Brindley, Estero High School, and John Courtney, Dunbar High School. And this year's first place category awards in physics and astronomy are presented to the junior division projects from Thomas Eichton, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, and Mason Huffman, Trafalgar Middle School. Congratulations to all of these students for their success in physics and astronomy. We'd like to congratulate all of these students for being finalists in the junior division of plant sciences as well as these students for being finalists in the senior division. This year's third place category awards in plant sciences are presented to the following projects. From the junior division, Isabella Peck, Calusa Middle School, Justin Wang, Trafalgar Middle School, and from our senior division, Jessica Marchese, Canterbury School. Second place category awards in plant sciences are presented to, from the junior division, Leah Scotty, Three Oaks Middle School, Levi Townsend, Oak Hammock Middle School, and from our senior division, Melita D'Souza, Community School of Naples. And this year's first place category awards in plant sciences are presented to the following projects. From our junior division, Olivia Lee, Trafalgar Middle School, Ivan Peeve, Trafalgar Middle School, and in our senior division, Bryce Kronfeld, Estero High School. Congratulations to all of these students for their success in plant sciences this year. Let's take a look 
and one of our Edison Fairs finalists. Hi, I'm Nishid. My study mainly contains two parts. One is a comprehensive analysis regarding the impact of microplastics on plant and soil and terrestrial ecosystems, and the second is to evaluate the bacterial degradation of microplastics. The science of microplastics and plastic pollution is a rapidly expanding interdisciplinary field that spans many academic and scientific disciplines. Microplastics are minute particles of plastic less than five millimeters in length. In my prior research, I found that microplastics cause sea ice to melt faster at a statistically significant rate and have the potential to biomagnify throughout the food chain. Effects of microplastics on terrestrial ecosystems, especially on plants, are comparatively understudied in comparison to other well-studied ecosystems. The main contributors of microplastics are plastic fibers from synthetic textiles, tires, and city dust. Because of their high persistence as global pollutants, which can survive for centuries, it is uncertain what they may cause or change in the environment. These plastics interact with other contaminants and facilitate their transport. Not only do microplastics convey harmful chemicals and ecosystems, but they also have a cocktail of dangerous chemicals that are added deliberately during their manufacture as additives to boost polymer characteristics and extend their life. Therefore, it is important to carry out studies to examine the impact of microplastics on certain biotic and abiotic components of the terrestrial environments, including plants and soil. The main objective of my experiment was to evaluate the impact of microplastics on pea plants, onion plants, and the soil, and to determine bacterial degradation of microplastics in soil, which would be a great source for bioremediation of plastic contaminated soils and a mechanism of waste management. I mainly used the Pisum sativum, the commercially available green arrow variety seed, more commonly known as the pea plant, and analyzed the effect of different types of microplastics litter and ground and sieve styrofoam. These are light micrographs of the microplastic particles. To evaluate the effects of microplastics on plants, I used eight characteristics as shown in the diagram. 14 criteria were evaluated for the alteration of soil properties with added microplastics as shown in the diagram. I collected a total of 3,864 data points for both soil and plant characteristics. Hypothesis. Research on microplastics in terrestrial environments is very recent. In fact, one article stated that by 2019, only one study had been completed. It is vital to the science community to complete more research. I followed standard methodologies to evaluate all the criteria. As the potting soil, I used commercially available soil, and these are pictures of the cups with pea plants. Here are pictures from a few key procedures, dry biomass, rate of photosynthesis by using the disk assay experiment, oxygen consumption experiment, rate of transpiration, these are the results from the following criteria. Root mass, styrofoam, and glitter. Number of roots, styrofoam, and glitter. There was a statistical significance in the data I collected for root mass and number of roots when the plants were exposed to glitter. The respiration of roots can be retarded due to physiological changes of the root systems caused by added microplastics. This would in turn cause a lower amount of root mass. Plant dry biomass. There was a statistical significance in the data I collected when the plants were exposed to glitter. Dry biomass was less for the glitter compared to the control. This can be due to the retardation of growth of plants due to the added glitter to the potting soil as the soil properties altered due to plastics and might have caused less available nutrients and water for the plants to uptake. There is no significant impact on plant height, number of leaves, rate of transpiration, oxygen consumption, and rate of photosynthesis for both glitter and styrofoam during my experimental time frame of two, three, and four weeks. Additionally, in August, I put two onion plants in water, one with glitter and one with none. After six months, the control has grown 24 centimeters taller than the sample exposed to glitter. This suggests that over time, microplastics will have an impact on plant growth. The following is a chart I made to help summarize the results. I conducted a two-tailed t-test on almost all of them. There's only a significant difference in root mass and number of roots and dry biomass when exposed to glitter. Out of 14 criteria for soil, six were checked at home, while other experiments were carried out with the help of graduate students at GCU due to safety reasons. Here are a couple of experiments I carried out at home. Electrical conductivity, kit used to check pH, nitrogen, and phosphorus at home, water holding capacity. For both microplastics, there was a statistical significant impact on electrical conductivity of soil. With glitter, it was higher, whereas with styrofoam, it was less. Poor drainage, saturated soil, low organic matter, or compaction due to microplastics can increase electrical conductivity. Electrical conductivity can be an indirect indication of the amount of water and water-soluble nutrients available for the plants, but it varies with plant species. 
Mostly for the pea plants, if the electrical connectivity is higher than the optimum values, it can cause adverse effects on plant growth by causing salt stress on plants. Low electrical connectivity can be correlated with drops in fresh weight and impacts on enzyme activities. Soil dry mass. There was a significant impact with both microplastics. For both types, it was higher than the control, which means that there might be a lower moisture content in soil. There is no significant impact on pH, phosphorus, nitrogen, water holding capacity, and organic matter on soil. In the long run, microplastics may increase microbial count and activity due to more porous soil with high aeration and can make soil aggregates, which will cause a high organic matter content. This is the nutrient testing completed at FGCU. Even though there is no significant impact on both glitter and styrofoam with any of these nutrient tests at the given time, impacts over a longer time frame are highly likely. The following graphs are for styrofoam. For the NOx, which is the addition of nitrites and nitrates, certain studies have shown nitrogen content has been increased when microplastics are added to soil over a longer time frame. Summary of soil data interpretation. Experiment to test the bacterial degradation of microplastics. After isolation from bacteria in different samples, they were checked for their ability to degrade microplastics in a minimal media. Table of results. According to the results, 12 out of 19 bacteria isolated from different soil samples were able to grow in minimal media with glitter and styrofoam, indicating that bacteria both gram positive and negative were able to break down microplastics. Limitations. Only one main plant species was used, so more plants will have to be tested to gain a broader idea. The particle size was too large to be absorbed by the plant's root systems, and I did not have the equipment to make nano-sized particles. Identification of microplastic degrading bacteria up to the species level is challenging, as genetic identification costs a lot of money. Conclusion. After collecting a total of 3,864 data points for all characteristics, five of the tested criteria, pea plant dry biomass, root mass, number of roots, soil electrical conductivity, and soil dry biomass showed a statistical significant impact with added microplastics. There is a high potential for the plants to get secondary effects over a longer period of time. This may include effects on its physiological and biochemical processes, such as complications with the plant growth and development, reduction of photosynthesis, wilting, reduction of yield, and a lower flowering time, and less available nutrients and water for the plants to uptake. Even though the added microplastics do not have a statistical significant impact on soil nutrient content, total nitrogen and phosphorus were less in percentages than the controls. This can be due to the lower release of nutrients from soil due to the added microplastics. Presence of bacteria with the potential to decompose microplastics would be a great finding to use them for bioremediation purposes. According to the results, the alternative hypotheses can be accepted as five of the evaluated criteria for soil and plants showed a significant difference and 12 isolated bacteria out of 19 were able to grow on microplastics in minimal media. In the future, I'd like to extend exposure time of plants to the microplastics, which would be a major reason for the adverse effect of microplastics on plants and soil as they may degrade over time. I'd also like to investigate methods of removing microplastics from terrestrial environments, especially bioremediation techniques. Points to ponder. Microplastics have been found in the placentas of unborn babies, and humans have enough plastic in them to fill a credit card. At the fundamental research level, there's also a need to collect more data on the true occurrence and consequences of these elements in the environment. Since only such precise understanding will allow for the development of appropriate and efficient laws. I would also like to research microplastic regulation through wastewater management plans. References. Thanks for watching. Don't forget students and families. You can share your STEM success from this year's fairs on our social media pages, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we encourage you to use the hashtag EdisonFairs in your posts. Over the last five or six years, we've annually awarded the Edison Cup for secondary school excellence in STEM. This year, with an overwhelming level of participation and success in our fairs, we'd like to present this year's Edison Cup to St. Francis Xavier Catholic School. Congratulations to all the students, staff, and family from St. Francis. And now for our 2022 Grand Awards. Students selected for these awards will receive trophies, ribbons, Sony prizes, and trips, including nomination 
to participate in state science fair, as well as nominations for senior division projects to participate in this year's 2022 Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair in Atlanta, Georgia. Beginning with our 2022 Grand Award winners from our junior division, these projects will be selected as state science fair finalists. All junior division Grand Award winners will receive a custom Thomas Edison medallion, an original 2022 Tercif poster designed by Vanessa Kinley, Benita Springs High School, a Sony Bluetooth wireless headphones, entry into the 67th Annual State Science and Engineering Fair of Florida, as well as an FGCU academic scholarship valued at $2,500. This year's Junior State Science Fair finalists include Abian Malik, Grade 6, Cresswell School, Kaylee Della Luna, Grade 7, Oak Hammock Middle School, Curacula Soraya Fernando, Grade 8, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School, Tanish Madhar, Grade 8, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School, Miles Hammond, Grade 8, Mid Cape Global Academy, Sarah Engel, Grade 7, St. Andrew Catholic School, Leah Chung, Grade 7, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, Thomas Eichton, Grade 8, St. Francis Xavier Catholic School, and Mason Huffman, Grade 8, Trafalgar Middle School. Moving now to our senior division, these projects have been selected to represent our fairs at the State Science and Engineering Fair in March. All senior division Grand Award winners will receive a custom Thomas Edison medallion, an original 2022 Tercif poster designed by Vanessa Kinley of Benita Springs High School, a Sony Extra Bass wireless portable speaker, entry into the 67th Annual State Science and Engineering Fair of Florida, and an FGCU academic scholarship valued at $2,500. Our senior division State Science Fair finalists include the following projects. Junwei Tan, Grade 8, Lee Virtual School. Laura Kendall, Grade 11, Canterbury School. Michelle Barnes, Grade 11, Canterbury School. Jax Mendelson, Grade 12, Lebanon Bay High School. Morgan Barnes, Grade 11, Canterbury School. Caroline Guerra, Grade 11, Community School of Naples. Isabel Liu, Grade 9, Dunbar High School. The team project of Am Druve and Nicholas Hardy, Grade 11, Fort Myers High School. Maya Chandar, Grade 12, Canterbury School. Maya Echeverry, Grade 10, Community School of Naples. John Cintron, Grade 11, Fort Myers High School. And Bryce Kronfeldt, Grade 11, Estero High School. Congratulations to all of these students for being selected to represent our Thomas Alva Edison Kiwanis Regional Science and Engineering Fair at this year's State Science Fair. Be sure to follow us on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Edison Fairs, because we'll be broadcasting and posting as our students participate in this year's State Science and Engineering Fair. And now it's time for our 2022 Best of Fair Awards across our junior and senior divisions. This year's junior division first runner-up, the winning project will receive a custom Edison Fairs trophy, as well as a Sony Extra Bass portable Bluetooth speaker. This year's first runner-up is Sarah Engel, Grade 7, St. Andrew Catholic School, for her project, A Salty Slick. Congratulations, Sarah. Our junior division best of fair. 
this winning project or projects will receive a custom Edison Ferris trophy, a Sony ZV-1 digital camera and vlogger kit, and a portion of this year's Newton Scholarship. This year's Best Affair is a tie between the following two projects. Congratulations to Curacula Soraya Fernando, grade eight from Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School. And congratulations to Mason Huffman, grade eight, Trafalgar Middle School. The two of you are our co-Best Affair Junior Division winners. Congratulations. Let's move now to our 2022 Best Affair Senior Division Awards. These projects not only are being classified as our Best Affair in Biological and Physical Sciences, but these student projects will also represent our Regional Science and Engineering Fair at this year's International Science Fair this May in Atlanta, Georgia. Our second runner-up, Biological Sciences, is presented to Bryce Kronfeld, Grade 11, Estero High School. Second runner-up, Physical Sciences, is presented to Caroline Guerra, Grade 11, Community School of Naples. First runner-up, Biological Sciences, is presented to Junwei Tan, Grade 12, Lee Virtual School. First runner-up, Physical Sciences, is presented to the team project of Om Dhruv and Nicholas Hardy, Grade 11, Fort Myers High School. And this year's Best of Fair Awards, both in biological and physical sciences, these winning projects will receive a custom Edison Fairs trophy, a Sony ZV-1 digital camera and vlogger kit, as well as entry into the 2022 Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair this May in Atlanta, Georgia. Congratulations to the following Biological Sciences Project. Best Affair presented to Laura Kendall, Grade 11, Canterbury School. And Best Affair Physical Sciences presented to Maya Chandar, Grade 12, Canterbury School. Congratulations to these six projects and seven students for being selected to represent our Thomas Alva Edison Kiwanis Regional Science and Engineering Fair at this year's International Science Fair in Atlanta, Georgia. And that concludes our 2022 Thomas Alva Edison Kiwanis Regional Science and Engineering Fair Award Ceremony. We again thank you for your patience with our virtual platform. We look forward to returning to an in-person event next year and at all the STEM success that our students, teachers, schools, and community will celebrate together. On behalf of the steering committee and our Edison Fairs program, we wish you the best and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.